<coughs> My name is Ken McIntosh, I'm the presiding officer, and I'd like to welcome you all to Holyrood this evening uh, to the debating chamber at this, our Scottish Parliament. I hope it's uh, familiar to you. I'm sure that many of you will have been here before. Uh, I think it's actually become a very familiar place for virtually everybody in Scotland these days, which is quite remarkable when you think that it's 20 years ago exactly this month that the first elections to our new Scottish Parliament took place. A new Scottish Parliament, and I still remember, and I'm joined by a group of fellow 99ers, as we're known. Uh, I still remember that sense of excitement, the optimism, the anticipation uh, that greeted us, the sense that we're going to offer a new kind of politics. And I hope that's what we're going to explore tonight. We're going to talk about the, the principles on which the Parliament was founded, openness and accessibility, accountability, the sharing of power, and the promotion of equal opportunities. And it's for you, not just for our panel, but for you to perhaps give us your thoughts and views and questions about have we lived up to these principles, are we still practicing them, and what can we do uh, to do better for the people of Scotland? I believe actually we're uh, joined, in fact, I think so over here, some of the early the members of the consultative steering group. I can see is here, Esther, is Joyce, and Andrew could be here as well, but they're not, but there are some members here as well. And, uh, uh, but we've got a distinguished panel to, to uh, answer to us. And also, uh, we're doing this um, presentation uh, in conjunction with Times of Scotland. And I'm, I can see Kenny Farquharson. I, just, I was looking for you, Kenny, around the audience. Uh, this is a Festival of Politics event, but we're doing it in partnership with the Times of Scotland. And if I can, Kenny, I'll bring you in to ask a couple of questions maybe uh, later on in the, in the evening. But I'm delighted to uh, introduce <coughs> our very dis distinguished panel this evening. So starting uh, on my right, uh, Annabel Goldie, now Baroness Goldie, uh, who is now a government whip in the House of Lords, but uh, for us was a, a, an MSP here, Conservative MSP from 99 till 2011, and a leader of the Conservative Party. 16, to 16. I've taken five years off your service, Annabel. <laughs> uh, and a leader of the Conservative Party in that time. Robin Harper, um, who... Uh, not just led the Green Party, and was an MSP here from uh, 99 to 2011. 11. Good to see, I'm gonna have to get my dates right here. 12 years. Yes, I know, it's age, it's 20 years. But was the first ever Green parliamentarian elected in British history, uh, a claim to fame, which I'm sure you're very proud. Yeah. Uh, and uh, on Robin's immediate left, George Lyon, who not only was uh, an MSP colleague, uh, a Liberal Democrat representing Argyll and Butte and part of that first uh, coalition government as a finance minister and as a business manager. That's one of the people who, whose job it is, is to organise um, the MSPs and get them to vote the right way or otherwise. Uh, but also went on uh, to serve uh, in Europe uh, as an MEP, just in case the B word comes up tonight. I'm going to throw <laughs> the questions. And now Tricia Marwick, who served for the SNP uh, from, from 99 as well till 2016, also served as a business manager, also served on the corporate body, which is the body that governs the running of this building and the, um, the, the support network that we need to actually keep the place functioning. But perhaps is still best and most affectionately remembered as our first and only woman ever elected as presiding officer here in the Scottish Parliament. And last but not least, Henry McLeish, who, as well as being, uh, and still is very proud to this day of being one of Scotland's first ministers, a, a claim which I think we're, we're all uh, very envious of, Henry. But more than that, you were an MP in Westminster, and as, as an MP in Westminster, was a devolution minister, so was actually responsible for putting through the act that brought about devolution, for which I'm sure you're also extremely proud. So, ladies and gentlemen, our panel this evening. Now, I, I talked earlier about the principles. One of the principles is the sharing of power, often translated into what's called participative democracy. Not just representative, but participative. That means that you have to participate, so think of questions. But before we do, I'm going to ask our guests if we can, just for a few short introductory remarks, uh, just to kick things off, just some thoughts on their own experience as MSPs, and perhaps either looking back uh, on the reflections on their time here in the Scottish Parliament, or perhaps even looking forward at some of the challenges. And I'm going to start in reverse order, if I can, with you, Henry. Okay. Well, thanks very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and thanks very much to all of you for uh, coming this evening. 
Uh, I have very fond memories of the, the whole devolution issue and very fortunate to be involved from 1997 to 1999. I'm conscious I'm, my back is to you, so I'm going to turn around a bit. Um, from 1997 to 1999, and these were really three years that changed the face of uh, Scottish politics for the good and forever. Um, and so that's a, a point that I think is worth, worth making. I suppose the other issue for me is quite nostalgic because whilst I spent 30 years in elected politics, this is the first time I've sat in the well of the new Scottish Parliament. Um, and I feel very privileged. And I feel very pleased as a result of that. My early recollections are that um, when we, 20 years ago, when the Parliament was established, there was a great sense of pride, great sense of occasion, great sense of history, great sense of excitement, enthusiasm, whatever good emotion you wanted to describe it, it was there. And I do believe that when we've got 20 years, it is a celebration. There will those who will rightly will be able to criticize, rightly be able to say it could have done this, it could have done that. But all in all, when you consider that Westminster has been on that site, not necessarily in parliamentary terms, but in administrative terms for nearly a thousand years, we've only been here for 20 years. It's the start. And I think that augurs well uh, for the future. And the final point I'd make in the opening remarks is that parliaments are essentially legislators, and this, that's what they're there to do. This parliament has become the voice of Scotland, it has become a platform for Scotland, it has been a focus for issues, and whatever the political party, this is where we debate them. But ladies and gentlemen, the key issue for me is the fact that since um, 1999, we've passed something like 280 pieces of legislation. Now, people who are against legislation might frown at that. But when we were in Westminster, we had one piece, one and a half pieces, two pieces per year. Scottish interests were not being dealt with. Scottish interests had to wait in a very long line. But once they had the Parliament, we have been able to tackle some of the big issues, whether it be land reform, whether it be health, whether it be education. And in that sense, I think all, everyone from every party has made a huge contribution to that. And as I said, this is merely the start, and I think the best days of the Parliament are certainly still ahead. Patricia, I think I saw you in the paper the other day talking in very similar terms about how the Parliament has become embedded in Scotland's public life. I think that's really important to say that um, I tell the story in the run-up to the Scottish um, Parliament elections where um, I was working for Shelter Scotland at the time, um, and I was an SNP candidate, and I was invited to um, a panel session with the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations, SCVO. And on that panel, I can remember quite vividly, Sarah Boyer was there, but I can't remember who else. So one of the questions that we were posed was, what difference is a Scottish Parliament going to make? And I told the story of um, when I worked for Shelter, that whenever we wanted to see the MPs, we had to go down to Westminster. There was a cross-party group on housing, and we had to all go trot down to Westminster to see them, uh, maybe for about half an hour. And there was about one debate a year on housing at Westminster, Scottish housing. That was what there was. So I was asked what difference it would make. And I would say, well, the first thing is that we can make legislation in our own Scottish Parliament. But the second and the most important thing of all is that half the population of Scotland is within an hour's journey of the Scottish Parliament. And even if we wanted to, the new MSPs will never be able to escape. And I think that is absolutely true. And when you see the engagement of the people of Scotland within their parliament, not just the visitors to the parliament, but the people who take part in the cross-party groups, the people who come in, the organisations who come in here for receptions uh, and to meet with MSPs, it is completely alien to what existed before 1999 and I think the greatest achievement of the Parliament is that it is now the centre of public life in Scotland. Um, it has got the ability um, to do so many things. Um, have, we le uh, have we met um, the brief of openness and accountability and equality and sharing of power? Um, we probably haven't got it right yet. Uh, but I think what is important is the journey that we have travelled. I think there was such great hope, such expectation of the Scottish Parliament when it was set up in the first place. Um, and I think in many ways um, we were set up to fail. 
because we could not, at the beginning, meet those expectations. We were being held to such a high standard that it was almost impossible. That is not to say that we were uh, not culpable in some of it, the MSPs. We made some mistakes at the beginning, um, but it seemed to me that there was no forgiveness for those mistakes. It was a new institution. We were really, really lucky um, that we had the steering group who came forward with um, proposed standing orders and the way the parliament should operate. Um, and I think they did a great job under Henry's chairmanship. And I can see a few people here. Uh, but I think the difference was that that was a hypothetical parliament. And until such times as we actually got in here to see how it worked and what we actually needed, um, it was um, a bit difficult. But I'll look back on the first 20 years of Scottish Parliament and there's been huge achievements. Free personal care for the elderly, um, tuition fees, um, taking away the tolls on the fourth and the three bridges, which is very, very close to my heart. Um, and if you look at the Scotland that we had in 1999 um, and look at the Scotland we've got now, it is a different place. And just two examples of that. The convulsions that we had over um, Section 28 in the Parliament, right in the early days, when it seemed that everybody was uh, up in arms about it and a lot of Scotland wasn't happy. And then one of the proudest moments of my tenure as presiding officer was presiding in the chamber when this Parliament passed the Equal Marriage Act. And it meant so much, not only to the people that you know were the beneficiaries of that, um, but it also gave a message about how far Scotland has travelled. And I don't think Scotland would have travelled that far and that fast if it hadn't been for the Scottish Parliament. Thanks, Trish. George, you've uh, had the benefit now of two parliamentary chambers. In fact, one on which this is almost modelled, the European yes, hemicycle. Um, so how do we compare as an institution? Well, I think my experience, uh, of this, first of all, of the Scottish Parliament, uh, I came from outside politics. I was not involved at all. I was a farmer. I lived, brought up in the island of Butte. Uh, I had all the challenges of, of living in a, in a rural uh, area, trying to run a business and trying to create employment. And then I became involved in lobbying through the National Farmers Union. And the biggest difference the setting up of the Parliament did uh, for rural Scotland, I think, is it brought us much closer to the decision making, as uh, Tricia said earlier on. You, you had to travel to London uh, if you were involved in trying to get decisions about how your future political direction for your industry would go, is either London or, or Brussels. Uh, and the setting up of the parliament brought the islands closer to the seat of power uh, because. Uh, it's not quite an hour's drive right enough from where I live to here, but compared to going to London, it's still much more accessible. In terms of comparisons with other parliaments, uh, the biggest difference between the two is that here, everything you do, you are held accountable by the media for what you say or what you do, and therefore party discipline here is probably now as tough as it was at Westminster. Uh, and, and there's rigid, uh, and I'm not sure that people actually thought that would happen, uh, given the, the type of parliament we're trying to create where compromise and, and working together was going to be the way we actually did business rather than the confrontational approach. Uh, the difference between that and Europe, of course, you can say what the earth you like. <laughs> it doesn't matter what you say, nobody reports it because it's an invisible institution where a lot of big decisions are taken that affect ordinary people's lives but it's not accountable in any way, shape or form because the media don't actually engage and report what's going on. So it's quite a, quite a different institution to work in. There's one big commonality between the two. In this parliament, many of the speeches were always laced with only we had the powers to, we would be able to sort this problem. Well, the exact same happens in the European Parliament. They want more power as well, but they want to take it from national to this international organisation we've set up, whereas in the Scottish Parliament, it was the reverse. So no matter where you go and which institution you're in, there's a common thread about only if we want more power and there's this, this, this notion that that actually is a way to solve problems rather than sometimes being an excuse for actually using the powers you have to try and resolve the issue. So that, that, that's the biggest difference and the biggest similarities. Uh, between the two institutions. That's good. Well, you've, you've set off, I'm sure, a train of thought amongst half the <laughs> audience already here. 
Robin, uh, I introduced you, you know, the first ever Green parliamentarian, but now the Greens are doing pretty well. Do you, do you, did you feel like a pioneer at the time? Did, was, was the Scottish Parliament good for the Green Party and for you personally? Um, yes, it was a bit top-heavy because we had very... I don't think we had any green councillors at that time. We now have green councillors really embedded in Edinburgh and Glasgow, and the balance has, has uh, been... Well, it was, there was no balance to restore. We now, we now have a balance, if you like, of, being rep of representation at the local as well as the parliamentary level. Um, I think what really struck me... You were talking about the, the hemicycle with, with, with George. It was a much more closed... Um, uh, circle and so you could have eye to eye contact with almost everybody in the chamber in there and I do remember I think we were all so everybody was so happy to be there you know <laughs> it was <laughs> we were all wandering around with big smiles on our faces sort of saying god has it really happened um, uh, and 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 that did pervade most of the first four years of the parliament we made friendships friendships uh, at, at that time and I could see one or two old mates from those times as well I was able to run a parliamentary show in the Edinburgh Festival with representatives of every par party at, uh, uh, doing their bit I can see Jamie at the back there uh, sang a, a great song for us um, the, re the reception is afterwards Jamie's just <laughs> <laughs> good guitarist um, and, and you went into committees and you would probably found it very difficult to tell which member, which party people were members of in committee discussions because we took those discussions very seriously um, and, and, and discussed things absolutely on their merits. Um, and the amount of influence that, they, that was allowed, I have, maybe, maybe these will come out uh, later as the process of this evening goes on, but um, as Donald Geer said in his wonderful opening speech, devolution is not an event, it's a process. And it has continued. There's been more devolution since. I would like to see it go much further down. Um, our community councils, for instance, are a joke. It's in, in, in the same way that school councils are a joke. If you don't give people money to spend, they've got no decisions to take or make anyway. Um, and that's what happens in far too many school councils and far too many community councils have a little bit of money, just a pickle pickle um, uh, uh, of money. There could be more de devolution there and we'd have a stronger democracy all around because people would be involved um, at their very local levels in decision making. Mm. Um, I could go on and on about that, but there, there is one thing I'd like, can, can I just finish on, course, on one thing to give you an idea of how open the parliament was. Obviously, as the design for the Parliament um, unrolled, as the sole representative of the Greens, I wanted to make sure that it was as uh, uh, environmentally friendly as I could possibly make it. Now, um, one of the things I continued to do is to, uh, work with the Scottish Ecological Design Association. At that time, I managed to get four architects together with me. And we sat in front of the design people, the people from... Um, Oh, the, the um, contractors. Ramjam, RMG. Ramjam and, and Ram um, the, the, the builders. And we had two hours with them, quizzing them. And, and that, that was, it was just me, you know, backbencher, just one person in one party. But that was the amount of access that you could get to um, working with people where you needed to ask a few questions. Thanks. Thanks very much, Robin. And uh, I'm just conscious that the, one of the aspects of the problem is the budget has grown and it's now well over 30 billion. Uh, I'm trying to work out what a pickle pickle is in the 30 billion. <laughs> so, how we, a pickle. <laughs> Annabelle, um, it's strange to think of it now, but in 99, the Conservatives were at, uh, at a low. And uh, in many ways, the Scottish Parliament was actually, and the voting system was actually very good for the Conservative Party. <laughs> Would that be fair to say? Uh, yes. Um... I think low is perhaps charitable. Um, sinking through the floor seemed to be my recollection of the, of the times. And I was looking, Joyce, at you, and I remember being in a debate, and Joyce Macmillan ate lumps out of me during this debate. And I thought, golly, is this politics? And am I really wise to be standing for this parliament? And, you know, Robin, I may not have been in your party, but I do remember coming here. Green was how I felt. Absolute <laughs> rookie. And I thought... This is, this is 
tough. I mean, it's exciting, and it's, it's, I think we all felt we were part of history, part of history in the making, and it was an extraordinary sensation, a great privilege to feel that. Um, but we also had a sense of, of burden, we had a sense of responsibility. As I say, we were, I always remember going into asking someone where the ladies Lou was, and I went in, and here were all these ladies of different political background. What were we interested in? I like your lipstick. Where did you get that foundation? You know, and immediately there was a kind of bond of a sort of amity. Um, and I think that actually was one of the features of the Scottish Parliament, that in a sense, although party political differences were there and, and party politics was important in the democratic function of the Parliament, you know, there was a sense that we were actually a political community of Scotland and very, very proud to be that, very proud to be that. Um, but I remember, uh, you know, I come in and look at that desk there and I, I think of how I would have to stand up at First Minister's questions. I had to try and ask the questions and um, be regularly uh, pulped by, you know, one adversary or another. Um, but there was also a huge sense of, and I think you referred to it, Rob, in this immediacy, that there were very important decision makers just sitting along from you in the form of the Scottish government, and yet we were close to them in terms of access, we were close to them in terms of discussion, um, and one of, the, one of the features that struck me forcibly about the Scottish Parliament was the accessibility, the accessibility for the, for the public, um, for people who wanted to access politics, whether they came as visitors to visit MSPs, whether they came as witnesses to committees, you know, whether they came as spectators to watch the proceedings as they, as they um, unfolded. It was, it was, and I believe still is, one of the most accessible parliaments you will find, and I think that's hugely to its credit. Right. Well, thank you very much for these opening remarks. Now, that phone going off has just reminded me uh, not just to switch my own off, actually to get out because uh, this um, uh, programme has been broadcast actually and we're also taking questions on social media. So I'll be taking the odd uh, remark here. But um, this is now, we're now open to questions. Um, and so anybody that wants to catch my eye, just put your hand up. Or, and uh, I've noticed quite a few former colleagues in there. Oh, look at that, Richard Simpson straight in with his hand up there. So anybody that wants to catch my eye, uh, please do so. So I'll take Richard Simpson and then I'll take the gentleman at the back there. Richard. Two, two quick questions. In the first parliament, we had a part of the European system. We had reporters. And uh, when I came back in 2007, having been out for four years, the reporter system had disappeared. Now, I wonder if the panelists felt why, you know, why that happened and whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. And my second question is, I think the media did give the parliament a real kicking in the first term. Uh, and I just wonder if the panelists felt that that was the case uh, and whether they feel it sort of settled down over the time that they were in. A couple of good questions there. Trisha, I'm going to turn to you simply because uh, I'm not sure if any of us know why the reporters were less used, but uh, I know that... Um, as presiding officer, you introduced a series of reforms, including uh, some to committees, which um, some of which are still to be implemented and which are still in, in discussion. Um, do you have any comments to make about the role of committees and the way they worked and the way they still work? The committee system here was set up to be a hybrid of the standing committees and the select committees at Westminster. Um, and the, um, I think the jury's out about whether that has been the most effective way of doing it. I don't think so. Um, I um, think that there should be a system where the committees can be set up specifically for one piece of legislation, um, as they do in Westminster. Um, I have not been convinced that the committee system has been as effective as it could have been. But in the particular point about the reporter system, I actually don't know the answer to that, Richard. It was up to the individual committees to decide whether they wanted reporters or not. And I can't think of any sort of edict from the Bureau or anybody else um, discouraging that from happening. I think it was down to the committees that whether they thought it didn't work or not, I don't know. Um, but I think, there, like you, I think there was a bit of a waste of an opportunity um, if that happened. Um, but I think Ken's right. I mean, I... Uh, brought in a number of reforms. Um, I tried very, very hard to 
reformed the committee system. Um, I've got to say, um, it was like trying to pin Blamange to a wall to try to get any of the business managers to agree with it. Um, we did get away with uh, introducing topical questions on a Tuesday, changing the uh, format of the week, going, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays, instead of just meeting Wednesday, Thursdays. And I think these are both great. Perhaps um, the changes to the committee system, and not least um, the proposal for elected conveners uh, that I put forward. Um, I think the most charitable way I can put it right now is its time had not come. Uh, I think there were people within the Parliament from all parties who thought the reforms had gone far enough. Um, and I know that um, Ken has uh, taken on that mantle. Um, I'm hopeful that we will get um, elected conveners um, by the start of uh, the next session uh, because I think elected conveners are really, really important. Um, they um, show that uh, it gives a message that the conveners are elected by the parliament and not just simply appointed by their political parties. And I think when we talk about um, sharing power and openness and uh, accountability, I think that is one piece of unfinished business uh, that needs to take place. I wonder, Henry, if I could also bring you in this, just because uh, the point that Richard makes, that, that there was going to be this new style of working in the, in the Scottish Parliament. Now, you'd experience, you've experienced the Westminster style, mm -hmm. and there is a lot of, uh, and not everyone will be aware of this, but there, the, the government at Westminster has a lot of powers of patronage, a lot of paid positions. Uh, it's interesting to note that since the Scottish Parliament was set up, Westminster has reformed, and they've now got elected conveners. It's made a difference. So, have you any thoughts about that, the, those contrasting styles, having experienced them both? I mean, the work of the Constitutional Steering Group was essentially to look at Westminster, and not for the sheer hell of it, but try and devise something for Scotland that would overcome what we perceived as some of the problems there. And clearly, and I mean, I, I hate to use the B word, but I mean, we see excessive tribalism, excessive partisanship, um, and huge power of the executive, which has always been the case at Westminster. So there was a great determination to try and move this on. I mean, even the horseshoe-shaped parliament was a major change. You know, at Westminster, you know, you have, you have the chamber, you have the boxes, you have two red lines running up the chamber, which are two sword lengths apart. So in the early days, if you didn't win by a discussion, you could take them outside and have a sword fight. Um, you know, so all of that was to be pushed into the background. Um, and I think it significantly worked Although, when you talk about the rapporteur, the European, it was really part to Europeanize our parliament and the way we do things. Because I'm a great believer in the idea of coalitions. I'm a great believer in the idea of consensus. And certainly in the early days, it was an experiment with the Lib Dems. But, you know, you actually talk to the opposition parties. How novel. How novel when you reflect on it. And so it seemed to be that there was a push to be more European than there was to be more Westminster. Um, and just a point, uh, presiding officer, on the, the question of um, the committee system. The com committee system at Westminster does have powerful investigative committees. I was privileged to be on the Public Accounts Committee in my early days. I don't think we've quite replicated the same level of investigation, investigative committees in the Scottish Parliament. Partly because of numbers, you have 129 people, it's very difficult to have bill committees and select committees spread it over. That's why they were joined. But I believe in the future there's much more purpose that we could embrace in relation to more, more investigations. And, and just for pure interest tonight, my first invitees would be ScotRail. But as a five traveller, <laughs> I'll leave it, uh, leave it at that particular point. So in that sense, the committees, I think, could have another look. I agree entirely with the idea that the parliament should vote in the chairs and not the party uh, structure. Again, we'd be moving in a very positive way, not because we're trying to distance ourselves from Westminster, but to be quite honest with you, the governance of Scotland looks exemplary at the present time relative to the shambles that exists at Westminster. And to move forward with the parliament we've got I think there's great opportunities and hopefully we'll take them. Thanks very much. Young man at the back there. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Patrick Brown. Um, my question was around uh, Donald Durr's famous 
phrase about devolution as a, an event and not a process. And I suppose those of us who have observed devolution um, as it's developed would say that it's developed quite asymmetrically across Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. I suppose given that one of the, uh, among many other reasons, one of the, the, the core tenets of devolution was that it would, I suppose, appease nationalist sentiment in, in Ireland, Wales and Scotland. Has that asymmetry with hindsight had the opposite effect and actually fragmented the concept of the union and the unionist identity in the UK? Well, that's a, a huge question. I think the one that, that many people ask about, you know, has, has devolution encouraged a certain direction of travel or, or worked against it? Annabel, can I just bring you in on that, on that very point? And I think it also is something Robin touched on as well, but perhaps centralisation and localism. But do you think that is, is the United Kingdom a different place because of devolution? But is it actually, actually now moving in a totally different direction and fragmenting? I can see why, from one perspective, you might, you might think that. I actually have a feeling that with the global world in which we live, you know, where um, it's very important, I think, that individual um, constitutional entities have influence, whether that is Scotland with its devolved parliament, Scotland's part of the United Kingdom. I actually don't think devolution has threatened the union. I think what devolution did was it gave people a confidence that they could address a lot of domestic issues locally in Scotland, and I think have, you know, have been doing that to um, very good effect. Now, there will be different views as to the policies and the politics of what should be applied in that scenario. But I think if you have that confidence to deal with domestic issues, you know, you you can feel at ease with a constitutional structure where you are part of a, as we are part of a partnership of, of another four nations. And um, we don't know what lies ahead. Certainly the last independence referendum in Scotland, when people were given the choice, they decided to stay with the existing constitutional structure. We do not know what lies ahead. I mean, no one will be surprised to hear that I, I think the union has a value and I think it's something that's worth supporting that it um, delivers benefit. Others will dis disagree with that. But um, I don't think of itself, just because we have devolution, that of itself is a threat to, to the union. Um, I think what may be a greater threat to the union is whether voters feel impotent, um, marginalised, um, uninvolved, disengaged. That, to me, is a much more dangerous scenario and that's where there's an obligation on all politicians to try and ensure that they are doing everything they can to dispel that view. It, can I go back to the committee thing, yes, Ken, you can. if I may? Because there was something which did strike me as um, Henry and Tricia were speaking. Because the Scottish Parliament um, is unicameral, because it's a one-level legislator, the, the committees were always going to have a vital role in reviewing legislation because the strength of the legislation, no matter how well intended by the Scottish government um, of the day, regardless of its political composition, the strength of the legislation is only going to be as good as the scrutiny, the preparation, the exploration, and the ability to identify weaknesses or flaws before that legislation finally uh, is translated into law. And this is where I feel that if I may say so, I think the Scottish Parliament has got a distance still to travel because it seems to me that the strength of the Parliament would actually be enhanced and reflected by stronger committees. I do feel mm. that very firmly. I have to say, as a part of the government at Westminster, <coughs> sitting in the front bench in the House of Lords, I can tell you some of the most difficult things I have to deal with are committee reports from the House of Lords where the convener is a member of my own party. And by golly, the punches ain't pulled, I can tell you. I mean, there's, there's a real sense of independent thought. There's a real desire to look at the issue regardless of party allegiance or adherence and try and actually get to the heart of what is working and not working, what may be strong, what may be weak, what might be an improvement, um, what might be uh, worth eliminating or um, uh, getting rid of. So I do feel that in a sense there's still a journey for these committees to go, and I think the Parliament, and I think Scotland would benefit if some fresh air could blow through the committees, and the backbenchers making up these committees felt they had a voice, 
a voice that really could resonate. And also, you know, not all talent is found in government. Very, very important talent can be found in the back benches of all political parties. And I think it's important in a parliament to give these backbenchers an opportunity to show their skills, flex their muscle, and let them get on with doing a good political job, which many of them are very capable of doing. And I think at the moment it's slightly inhibiting under the current committee structure for that process to take place. I think, I suspect we might come back to this whole issue of party discipline, tribalism, party loyalty and so on, and how the conflict between that and the promise of the new politics. But George, I want to bring you back in, uh, perhaps uh, back on that earlier point about the nature of the political uh, setup in, in the United Kingdom at the moment. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think it's a fallacy to think that that's uh, actually facilitated the debate moving in one direction or another. If you look at European countries, there's a great mix of Germany with 16 landers who are, are relatively powerful, but it's still a very united country. I mean, they united after being being broken up after the Second World War. France, very centralised. And there's different models right across Europe. Uh, and not one model is actually responsible for any kind of political direction. What we do see, I think, uh, and what worries me most about politics is that the kind of post-war consensus we are sharing sovereignty, actually coming together and binding nations economically so that you can, you can actually act uh, together and bind the nations together. That whole post-war consensus seems to me to start to break down. Brexit's the classic example, the most extreme example of it. But we are not alone uh, in terms of countries around Europe where the exact same thing is happening. The rise of uh, parties who are much in favour of taking power back to the nation state rather than pulling at a supranational level. You only have to look at what's happening in the United States. Trump's whole agenda is driven by uh, America first. So it's a world, it's a, it's a big, big phenomenon. And I, I think we have, to, we, we have to put it into that type of context. And I think for me, I am unsure how we put all of this back together. We're about to have a European election. And I suspect that the populist parties could well be the official opposition in the European Parliament. The socialists and the EPP will not have enough uh, numbers to actually form a governing majority, which is what usually happens in, in the European Parliament. So it's that whole sort of worldwide pulling back from actually, it's actually about sharing power, sharing sovereignty is the right way to make sure that we prosper, that we deal with problems. Uh, uh, and that's the bit I think that really, really concerns me about where we're going at the moment. And I don't see a way that we actually manage to control and pull it back. Indeed, well, these are questions I think on, on many of our, our, our minds at the moment. Um, Ken, if you've got any thoughts, just catch my eye and I'll bring you in. It's, it's all been quite gentle so far. And uh, I know you've also been writing very supportive columns. Uh, and I'd also, anybody, you can ask questions from upstairs. Don't think you're out of the uh, line of sight there. I can see Jamie McGregor, one of my former colleagues. I'm just going to bring in a, a few other members first, Jamie, and I'll come, I will come back to you. I see a, a young man up there, and I'll come to you, Kenny. Yes, young man there with the red tie on. Yes. Oh, and here comes the microphone. That's good. Um, my name's Ryan McShane. I'm um, a member of the Scottish Youth Parliament currently, um, alongside my colleague Liam. Um, one of the main um, biggest um, successes we have had is um, implementing sort of votes at 16. And it was just to get your views as a panel if you think that's been successful in influencing young people to come into politics in Scotland. Votes at 16, yes, one of the, one of the again, the bigger changes that have taken place here. Anybody want to contribute first? Henry in first there. Just, just to agree, I mean, it makes no sense that uh, we shouldn't give 16-year-olds the vote in every election in the United Kingdom and in Europe. Um, and there's a big debate in the United States just now about, you know, in, in the aftermath of school massacres and a whole range of bad things that are happening in the US about young people getting involved. It, strengthens democracy and now people say a 16 year old doesn't have the experience doesn't have the knowledge doesn't have the brain power hey i meet a lot of people as old as i am and they've maybe not evolved either <laughs> so i think that uh, that position is not sustainable not tenable so i think it would be good it would be a shot in the arm because you know millennials young people generally there are so many issues including climate change which is so uh, understandably to the fore just now they should be involved and the best way to do that is to say not only can you contribute 
in rallies, campaigns, and other activities, but you do have the most powerful way to change in this country if you're a Democrat, and that is to utilize the vote that a lot of people fought hard for. So the sooner 16-year-olds get the vote, the better. Thank you, says. Kenny Ferguson from The Times. Any um, questions for our panel or any thoughts, in fact? Um, thanks, Presiding Officer. Um, in the spirit of learning from our mistakes, and learning from the past 20 years, can the panel identify missed opportunities uh, in their own personal experience, perhaps, and uh, regrets uh, over the last 20 years? Oh, that's always difficult, isn't it? I can see all their eyes ducking down now. And uh, uh, any, any thoughts? Any, anyone to go first? How about you, Robin? Did you take advantage of every opportunity? That's very unfair. <laughs> well, um, we, I don't know if we've, we'd have had a chance or not, but in the Green Party, we drew a lot of red lines, and I don't think it was a good idea to draw too many red lines in politics, you know, about who you're going to be able to work with and then why or why not. And I think we missed an opportunity in 2003. I won't go any further than that. Right. Yeah. Well, you'll leave us tantalised now. This is, <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, George, you're... Yeah, I think if you had predicted uh, before the parliament was set up and, and constituted that it's the big sort of policy differences that we, that we enacted, which were tuition fees, of course, and free personal care, free prescriptions, etc., that the parliament would choose actually to reward those who you would argue are, are the better off in, in society rather than taking that opportunity where there was a lot of public expenditure uh, available at that time to actually ta target those from, from the least well off in our society. So I think if you'd been arguing at the beginning one of the reasons for setting up the parliament would have been actually to tackle the problems facing those who were least, least well off and yet we took the decision to do the opposite in, in, in my view. Uh, I think the other one is, I, th I think if you had suggested that 20 years on down, down the track, we, that our governance structures below the Scottish Parliament would be, would be the ones that a Tory government in 1992, I think it was, put in place. So local government, health boards are virtually the same. The only difference we, we, where we've made, a, made change is, of course, on the police force, where that has been centralised and it's, that's not been without its difficulties. But I think in these two areas, it's really surprising that the Parliament chose to, A, to do nothing, and B, to, to, to make the choices it did make. Mm -hmm. Tricia, I can see you. I, I think there's been a lot of really fine achievements by the Scottish Parliament, and I think um, we should uh, focus on them quite a lot, whether it be votes at 16, whether it be minimum alcohol price in the smoking ban, free personal care, um, the adults were incapacity bill when the first piece of legislation that we actually passed in here. Um, but... I do think um, that the governments that we have had since 1999 have not been brave enough um, to tackle local government. And that there have been opportunities for local government reform that every single government has walked away from. I can remember having discussions with uh, my good friend, who's sadly no longer with us, Tom McCabe, who was Labour's first business manager, um, and Tom and I spoke often about the reform of the public sector. Uh, and I've got to say there has been no appetite very much to do it. I think there's a lot of vested interest in making sure it doesn't happen. And that's why I said that I thought, you know, none of the governments have been brave enough to say, we've now got a Scottish Parliament. Um, it was never anticipated that local government would stay exactly the same. Uh, there should have been um, some sort of commission to look into local government reform. And I think that is one of the areas of Scottish public life that we do need to look at and we do need to address because it is ridiculous that you've got 32 local authorities, 32 chief executives, 32 directors of education, 32 directors of do, 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 do. We are a country of five million. Um, and if you're going to reform local government, you do need to talk about uh, what Robin talked about, and that is um, devolving down to the lowest possible level, the community councils, making sure that they've got power. It was always assumed that the community councils would have a big say in Scottish life um, when they were set up in the first place, and it simply never happened. Uh, so I think that is the 
big gap that we have got. And I think that's what should have been tackled. Just, so, George, yeah, to, to, be, to be fair, though, we did change the voting system. PR for local government actually broke up all the big strongholds where it was dominated by one party. So we did, a, we did one step, but we were frightened to touch the, 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 uh, the actual infrastructure and the governance that, 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 that sat there. But I think at least you can argue that, that, that PR for, uh, for local government made a huge difference in terms of... of who sits and represents those in the town halls and made sure that, that your vote actually counted. And I, I think that's, that was to be applauded. But the rest of it, we just backed off because we were either too scared or now, I can unsure. See, I can see all the colleagues want to come in now, and I'll bring you all in. But I want to bring the audience in first. There's a gentleman right there, and then Jamie. Yes, yes, yes that's the guy. Yeah. Um, well, my question is really about, uh, uh, you've went through the celebration part and how, how, how you come into being. But just uh, some points you are bringing up uh, in relation to transparency and, sc and scrutiny. And Robin, you brought it up first in terms of community councils and school councils. And, and they're just a token paper exercise. They don't represent anybody other than the head teachers or the local political party that's most dominant in an area. And they'll, they'll only get funded when they want to push them on a, on a specific reason. Uh, and, and it's the same here, but I mean, I, I watched the conveners uh, debate yesterday and each convener was discussing with, with the First Minister the lack of transparency in health, the lack of accountability in health, the lack of ability to get data for things like young people's mental health and how that was operating throughout the country and throughout local, local authorities and health boards. I happened to go to Strathclyde today and there was a talk and it was young carers that were there. And it was, it was heartbreaking listening to them because I've not, I've not got any involvement in that. But when you're saying you're looking for a committee uh, to be, a, you know, a, a chair to be elected, why isn't that somebody that's been a carer or been in the care system? Why, why, would, why do you think you, you know, is there not a bit of arrogance about you having a committee to discuss what they've been through when in fact they should be making the agenda and pushing it forward? There was another very interesting guy there who was a judge or a, a sheriff. And he was looking at the difference between putting the, uh, community payback and actually getting individuals that are going into difficulties and making sure they were getting housing, getting a job, getting training, getting health. All things you would think other human beings would expect. But these guys just didn't know how to manage it because of the, the trouble they had through in their lives. So it's all very good having a discussion here about legislation. But it's just a piece of paper. And if you haven't got the scrutiny here and you haven't got the scrutiny locally, and people can't access it and can't complain about it locally, then you've got to ask yourself, what's different between you and Westminster, really? Indeed. Well, obviously, you've raised a number of points there about transparency and openness, about whether or not, for example, the, the, the lived experience of, of people is taken account of here, which perhaps we'll pick up on. I can tell you, just, just speaking for somebody who's still a parliamentarian, that the committees are still very, very actively engaged in trying to hear directly from the people whose, uh, whose lives are shaped by the public services uh, delivered or, 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 or financed by this parliament and the laws shaped by this parliament. So there's an attempt to listen to those voices. Now, whether that translates into the service that they want to receive is a different matter. Uh, but I think there's an attempt. Now, Henry, uh, you wanted to get back in, possibly on the earlier point, but... Oh, yeah, but uh, a comment on that. I mean, my concern is a genuine one about local government. I mean, I was the leader of Fife Regional Council in the 80s. Um, it's kind of maybe a purple patch for local government. But I think there's a crisis in local government. There's a financial crisis. There's a crisis of confidence. There's a crisis of identity. And the point you make is, I mean, I'm no great believer in strengthening alternatives to local government through community councils and school councils. I think there are people capable of running communities and running schools that don't need to be elected or participating. And unless we take seriously local government, it is diminishing in its confidence in the way it goes about. And it's not just about money. And one of the reasons why I think we're flailing a bit is because um, we talk about a constitution. Now, the UK doesn't have a written constitution. Scotland, at this point, doesn't have one either. So what is the function of local government? And how important is it regarded in our, in our society? How important is health in our society? How important is the relationships between people and our parliament? Relationships between Europe, Westminster and here. If you look at Europe again, you find there's much more interface facing taking place between different levels and more respect. And I believe that one of the problems we've got is antipathy. When I was a Westminster MP, um, uh, I was in local government, was in the Scottish Parliament, 
And at every level, there is not the same trust, respect, understanding that there should be to create a more uh, healthy environment. But what I just wanted to say was Kenny's point about, um, you know, he was asking about, well, couldn't it be done better or what should we have done? Um, and let me be radical here, um, Kenny, and say that when we started the Scottish Parliament, we're thinking about the Scottish Parliament from the Convention, there was this notion that we'd have a list system, which is a form of PR, but we'd still have first past the post. That never produced natural, long-lasting coalitions in the way that I'd like to have seen them. So one of my ideas for the future, and I have to say it's only an idea in my head, is that why don't we go for electoral reform, scrap the first past the post, and have Scotland's parliament elected on a major change in line with much of what's happening in Europe. Now, it is only an idea, but it's to try and overcome the point that I think as a parliament, we have to want co consensus. We have to want coalitions. And look, 95%, 96% of everything that happens in here most people agree with. But the politics of tribalism can end up as exploiting the politics of difference. So we will fight on the 4%, but we will agree on the 96. And so therefore, there's a simple message to me in that, that the parliament has done extraordinarily well, and I'm a great champion of it, something to celebrate. But I think it's practical steps we can take, as I said, to become more Europeanized, regardless of Brexit and whatever happens there, and also take Scotland forward in the way that has been, been outlined by the fact that not only have some of the legislation been sound secure for Scotland, but it's world-class legislation. The Parliament put through the ban on smoking in public places, the fourth country in the world to do that. That should give us impetus to be more ambitious, more assertive, maybe more aggressive. And Parliament should be the way to lead Scotland forward, and I think there's great opportunities in that sense. Now, a number of people have caught my eye. I'm going to take uh, Jamie McGregor first, and then uh, the young woman in the first front row there. Jamie McGregor. Uh, thank you. Um, yesterday, I got uh, a message to do with the European elections from Mr. Farage. I expect many other people got it as well. And my son said to me, I see you got a message from the Breakfast Party. And I said, no. I said, isn't it called the Brexit Party? And I said, why do you call it the breakfast party? He said, well, it's a dog's breakfast, Dad. Um, but my two questions are, um, the only point he made in it was that British politics is broken. My first question is, does the panel agree with that, or will normal service be returned in a couple of years or so? And the second point is, if the Scottish Parliament had to deal with it, would it have been much more effective or would the same thing have happened? All right. Now, simple questions. I'm going to ask Annabel and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask Annabel to think about it for a second, but I'm going to bring in uh, the young woman in the front row of the uh, gallery there, who also caught my eye. Just I want to get more audience participation. And just while we're waiting, I'm getting an, a lot of um, questions on Facebook now. Um, Another one about, uh, shouldn't there be greater youth involvement uh, in the Parliament? I've had several questions about that. A specific question for you, Tricia, about your involvement in politics as well. So, um, Young woman. Uh, I was wondering if the panel could share their thoughts on the impact that devolution and the establishment of the Parliament has had on the uh, involvement and representation of women in Scottish politics and perhaps what work is still to be done, how we might go about that. Thank you. So, Annabel, I'm going to bring you in first, so you might want to deal with that um, question, but the involvement of women in politics, uh, or the couple of um, set-up questions from, uh, clearly, from Jamie McGregor for you there, well, and the then Robin. I, the one I liked best was from Kenny. <laughs> 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 but I'll try and cover all. Kenny, you asked, you know, was there anything we regretted, any, any omission that we, we, we regretted? Yeah, in my case, I regret greatly I did not join the Scottish Parliament Weight Watchers Club, <laughs> which was... Um, attended by a number of colleagues to very good effect, and uh, it is a salutary instruction to me to learn from what others are doing and not be afraid to do that. If I may go to the young lady, first of all, about um, women's representation. I mean, the whole, one of the founding um, aspects of this parliament was it should be family-friendly, that it should be constructed in a way that it did not 
uh, prejudice against or militate against women being part of it. And I think I'm correct in saying in the first election in 99, we had a very good female representation. I can't remember the precise percentage. 48. Was 48, it 48? women, 37 percent representation. Yeah. And, and it was a very credible performance indeed. And it did suggest that the, the sort of architecture of the, the parliament, not the buildings, but the architecture of how the parliament should be designed and how it was meant to function was perhaps having uh, an effect on that. I know there was a dip in subsequent elections and then I think it went back up again. So um, it's not something I think we can ever take for granted. I think, um, I think some women um, will naturally um, want to have a voice, be good at having a voice, and will find out a way in which to use that voice. And we've had some very, very fine examples of that in this parliament from all parties over the last 20 years. Um, but there may be other women who still feel inhibited, and I think there's maybe still a job to be done about how we reassure, give confidence, educate, and uh, it's partly for the political parties to do themselves. Um, but I think on the whole, we've got quite a good story to tell. You know, we've got Nicola Sturgeon, female first minister. Tricia was the first female presiding officer. Um, a number of female leaders of parties up here have been produced. So um, a good example, good example, and I think encouragement for other women, but not something that should ever leave us taking it all for granted because that will not work and we can't take it for granted. Um, the really big question from, not implying the other questions weren't big questions, but the testing, the perplexing question from Jamie McGregor. Um, I have to say that Brexit has been one of the most um, divisive issues I've known in my whole life, whether in or outside politics. And as many of you will be aware, Brexit has divided families, it's dividing parties. Um, it has proved to be an issue uh, around which it has been very, very difficult to uh, get any form of, of consensus as, as Henry was, was desirous of seeking. Um, my own view is that, um, and I was a Remainer, I voted to Remain, but, you know, if you say to people, we're going to give you a say and we're going to listen to what you tell us, you know, I think there's a huge obligation to get on and deliver that. I really do. And I think that what we're seeing is a disillusion by the public in politicians across parties, I have to tell you. Um, and certainly down at Westminster, there has been a constant um, demonstration of um, anger and frustration by both sides of the argument, um, with placards saying that politicians are denying them what they want on the one hand, and on the other hand saying that politicians are betraying the country and, and we should remain. And this is proving to be a very, very difficult issue indeed. Now, um, time is going to, I think, um, ensure that one way or the other something happens. One way or the other, my impression is that the country is crying for the thing to move on in some fashion. And... Um, I think once that has happened, um, and, and we cannot tell what's going to happen in, in the House of Commons. Um, when the House of Commons took control of the business schedule of the Parliament and said, look, we're taking control, we're not letting the government now run the business of the Commons, we, the House of Commons, will take control, you know, fair enough, but they weren't able to agree on anything. Um, so that is a measure of the sort of paralysis we're in. It's not good for the country. Um, I don't think it's good for people's morale, and it's certainly not good for um, the integrity of politics. It's, 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 it's very damaging to it. I think we all want to see a situation where one way or the other's situation is resolved, and we move on. Because going back to Kenny's question, um, I was struck. I mean, I was looking at some headlines recently, and this is not a party political comment, but, you know, we're aware of challenges in the health service, we're aware of challenges in the education system, we're aware of a lack of uh, GPs, we're aware of a lack of uh, STEM subject teachers, we're aware of a worrying um, uh, level of students wanting to study the STEM subjects. Do you know, that was being talked about 10 and 12 years ago when I was in this parliament. So, you know, all I'm saying, Kenny, is that these issues are not new. And, you know, they have to be dealt with. They have to be dealt with. Now, whether that's political will, whether it's different types of policy, whether it's radical thinking, that is for the uh, MSPs in this place to determine. 
but I think it is revealing that, you know, 10, 12 years on, we are still discussing issues that were topical all that time ago, and we don't seem to have answers to these issues. Can I thank you, Annabelle. Um, Robin, a oh, smash of applause there. But, um, <laughs> Robin, um, I just want to bring you in because although um, the, the, the first question was set up there about the, the, um, uh, the possible breaking up of the current system, but in many ways, certainly breaking up a dominant two-party system has surely been a, a, for the benefit to hear of the Green Party and other voices, Lib Dems and others, to hear that multiplicity of political voices in Scotland. So do you think of what's happening now as that fragmentation as a bad thing or actually a good thing, an opportunity for, for Green politicians, for example, to meet their mark? Um, well, first, I, 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 I find it a bit frightening to think of it as being fragmentation, as if everything's breaking apart. The huge stresses, um, and those have been caused by the use of a very blunt instrument, the referendum, and I think we need to take a look at how we go about referendums. Uh, 51 to 49 percent divides the country. Um, perhaps we should say that there should be a higher point in a referendum like 60 percent of the vote before government has to take notice of it. Uh, um, that's, a, that's, a, that, that's the for, first point. The second point is that British politics have, I think, very successfully managed um, our present and our future for a large number of years through um, uh, most parties, or fact, all parties have their, their left, right and centre, and these sort of move together and um, where we find the answers that people are, can tolerate are where the, the centres of those parties collide, if you like, and, and we get the decisions that take us forward. What's happening now is that extremist populists um, are commanding um, people's attention in a way that they haven't done for very many, many years. I do find that frightening. I find that very dangerous indeed, um, that uh, the politics of assertion, um, this is something, you know, um, when actually there are very little in the way of fact or evidence to support what they're saying. Um, so this, this, I'm sure, can be addressed. But I think the mistakes were made. There should, we should never have had a referendum uh, for a start uh, on leaving Europe. Um, that, that was a, a dreadful mistake. Uh, but the other mistake was that um, Westminster, uh, bless their cotton socks, um, don't take it. The further away you are from Westminster, the more likely you are to be ignored. And that's why we wanted our own parliament. Um, and that's why the people in the north of England are so dissatisfied and so fed up with things as they are at the moment that they have reacted in the way they've done as the only way they have in their armory of taking a kick at Westminster. Mm -hmm. George, I can see you want to get in. I'll bring you in in a second. I, I'd also just comment, um, just following up on your point there, Robin, that um, uh, without wishing to be overly controversial, the Scottish Government is about to publish a new referendum bill uh, very, very soon. So it's, it's, it's not certainly off the political agenda. Now, we have a question about women MSPs. I'm very conscious. I can see Irene Oldfather, Margaret Smith and Mary Scanlon, three of my colleagues, our colleagues. Uh, and Mary Scanlon had her hand up to ask a question. Mary. Yes, I, I, I did, actually. I was quite struck by Henry when he mentioned over 200 pieces of legislation. But it was the gentleman in the second back row who really uh, hit home when he mentioned the young carer. And, and that's, he, he, he expressed a view that I feel about very strongly. Uh, I, I was here for four sessions of Parliament from 1999 to 2016, and it was one piece of legislation after another. It just kept churning and churning out. So probably I was part of well, I, countless pieces of legislation, but I spent about one day, one morning, doing post-legislative scrutiny on a minor, minor part of the mental health bill. And also, if I may say, uh, presiding officer, uh, three, four of us here were on the free personal care uh, bill in the first session of parliament. This was our convener. And uh, afterwards, it was the implementation of that. And I think what we believed was being implemented and passed in legislation was not how it was be implemented 
by local government. And quite often in uh, Parliament, you would say, well, what about this and what about this? That'll be done in guidance. So although we passed the legislation and the Act of Parliament, the important part of the scrutiny was guidance, and that was done by civil servants. And quite often that led to a disconnect between what we wanted to happen and what actually happened. I just wanted to put that in because uh, hit, this gentleman's comments really hit home. I can see that. And I can see, I don't know if I was coming, but before you do, I actually want to bring in Esther Robertson, if I can, Esther. Uh, and Esther, in case you know, was sat on the original consultative steering group that devised the principles on which this parliament is founded and which this discussion is uh, premised. Esther, you would make a point. Could I make a couple of points um, and come back to Mary's, I think, because that's really fundamental for me. Um, I was originally coordinator of the Constitutional Convention before I got into the, uh, the CSG, and I have to say I'm very conscious of big names like Campbell Christie and Kenyon Wright sitting on my shoulder. Um, tragic they're not here, and I can only think they would be hugely proud that we're here having this discussion because I would start by saying and Henry will smile I have a son who's almost exactly the same age and I can tell you he's not grown up yet so I think this parliament's still got some growing up to do <laughs> but it's a young person we should be very proud of because I think it's come a very long way I do think the committee discussion is the most interesting one of all and I'm going to remind you of some drafting you did Henry because you actually helped us in the CSG remember that the parliament wouldn't just be about legislation. It's a participative approach to the consideration, oh, I'll get the wrong word, development, consideration and scrutiny of policy and legislation. And I think Tricia made the point about our rules were hypothetical. We did enormous work on the number of bills we thought the parliament would deal with every year. We never imagined, despite the backlog we knew there was, it would do the amount of legislation that it's done. And I think there's two issues there for me. One is, I think we are at risk of thinking because it's a legislature, if we've got a problem, we should legislate for it. And sometimes legislation's not the answer. But the second bit is that when the convention okay. scheme devised the committee system, it was to make those committees really knowledgeable and really specialist in their area so they could hold the parliament to account so that it could do its own investigations, get out and meet the young carers and all of that. But because of the volume of legislation, they've not had the time to do that. And I think that's been one of the challenges. I like to think that legislative process will slow down a bit and we might step back from it. And I think picking up Mary's point, one of the things I was frustrated by was that we thought that the, par the committees would start at investigations of their own they would do the consideration of government, they would scrutinise legislation, and they would do the post-legislative scrutiny. So they would know what they were talking about. And I was really disappointed that it ended up in the audit committee, because I think that was not what was ever intended. And there may be good reason for it. So that, that would be my small point. But I think the committees have done a really good job in the circumstances on a workload we never envisaged, which has grown with the powers of the parliament when the numbers haven't. I think the only thing I would say, and a number of you have reflected on it, for me, I think the only disappointment folk around the convention table would have is that party politics and tribalism has played a much bigger part. And I don't think we can just blame Kenny and the media. I don't think it's all about the media at all. Um, I do think Henry's right. We in the public know that most of you, or not more you now, but you know, most of the politicians agree on most of the issues, but you wouldn't believe that when you watch what goes on in this chamber. So I'd like to think as the parliament matures, we might get back to that more consensual approach. Whether your answer is change the voting system, I'm not sure. But I, for one, am very proud of what the parliament's done. And I think it's something we should all be pleased about. And I'm delighted with some of the contributions the panel have made. Yes, so Trisha's brushed into this. Yes. Trisha's brushing to get in to respond to some of those points as well. Just to say how much I agree with Esther on this, um, the Parliament very quickly became a legislative sausage machine. Um, and the, legis the amount of legislation that was going through the Parliament, and I can remember in the first session, uh, we had to set up two justice committees uh, because there was so much justice legislation. And what that actually then did was to stop that investigative role that um, Esther um, has spoken about. It also stopped the post-legislative committee um, because the committees were so bound up with the legislation. 
And I've got to say, the cynic in me tells me um, that governments of all hues have actually um, been quite fond of the number of pieces of legislation because it makes the timetable of the committees their timetable and not the Parliament's timetable. Uh, the time scale for legislation to be examined and going through. And that leaves very, very little um, scope for anything else. And one of the huge disappointments that I've had um, was the lack of um, committee legislation that has gone through in the Parliament. Now, that was one of the key points that was made, that the Parliament committees should be able to bring through their own legislation. And I've got to say, as presiding officer, when I was a presiding officer, I would have all these meetings with the conveners groups and others and make suggestions about how we can change the committees, how they can be stronger, how we can do things differently. Um, and always at the back of it, I used to say to them, we have had no committee bills for I don't know how many years in the parliament. And that was one of the checks and balances. That was the bit about the sharing of the power between the parliament and the, and the government. Um, and that, I think, has been a disappointment to me. And like Esther, I hope that we can get off um, the treadmill that is legislation, 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 which sometimes you think is being done for the sake of it. We have a problem, we will legislate, we don't always have to legislate. There are policy solutions out there. Um, but what that number of pieces of legislation means is that the committees themselves, the committee members, are so tied up with them that they have no space to think, they have no space for their own investigations, and I think that is one of the biggest failures of the Parliament. I'm going to bring George back in. I said, uh, it's probably about an earlier point, George, but you're trying to attract my attention. I think it was when we were still talking about um, centralisation and localisation in this, in, in this Parliament. I mean, just to follow up on the, on the point that's made there, I mean, as a former whip, I know in the first two parliaments, <laughs> the, the committees were really very, very powerful. Uh, and there was, I mean, they were not, there was no control, there was no real control over what the committees did at that stage. Now, I've been out of the parliament for the last 10 years, but my feeling is that's not the way it is any longer. Uh, because committees were, were certainly very very powerful in their own right in the first two sessions. Uh, they tended to do their own thing. Uh, and the politics were much more of a compromise. People actually banded together, regardless of party, dis party allegiances, to actually come up with solutions. Uh, and I get the feeling that that's not the case any, more, any longer, that the party whips are all powerful and that it's very much on party lines. Mm -hmm. uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's certainly that was my experience in the first eight years. Was that as a party whip, it was very, very difficult to try and uh, manage that if you if you so felt as if you wanted to try and do it. It's virtually impossible. Mm. So just I mean, briefly say, um, as a member of the opposition for those first eight years, um, that was never my belief about the committees. Mm. Um, I can remember um, we did a housing bill. The government did a housing bill. Um, the SNP group put forward almost a thousand amendments. Not one single amendment was accepted by either the committee, where the um, uh, government parties uh, had a majority. Um, and I've got to tell you, from an opposition perspective, it was downright frustrating. Um, I can remember, I can remember, I sat at a committee and I'd put forward a, an amendment, which I had thought was a really, really good one. Um, and it was just ruled out completely wasn't accepted, not at all. So we came to stage three in the chamber and I had been going through all of the um, amendments and it suddenly dawned on me, the amendment that was getting moved by the government was the amendment that I had put forward <laughs> at stage two that they had voted down and they didn't even have the courtesy to say they were lifting my amendment. Yeah. So, you know, it wasn't all sweetness and light in the first eight years. Um, I am not saying that, you know, um, party <laughs> politics didn't get in the way afterwards, but, you know, let's not write a story about how wonderful it was under certain circumstances, and it wasn't. I think it depends whether you are in government at the time or whether you were in opposition. Yeah. At least you got your it way in the end. I know. <laughs> I'll, I'll bring Henry and then I'll bring Irene and the gentleman up at the back. Henry first. <laughs> Just to make you feel slightly better, Trish, 
you know, at Westminster, um, uh, amendments were just a joke because essentially, um, you know, I spent 10 years in opposition with uh, Mrs. Thatcher and uh, John Major, and essentially he went into committee, and so the Conservatives would sit, understandably, doing their uh, constituency business, because they were told, shut up. We put up umpteen amendments, and of course no opposition amendment was ever accepted. You know, when you then look, and this is why I come back to the short-termism, because essentially this is the Parliament's in its infancy, in a way. I think that it's absolutely right to say that the Parliament has been a huge success in terms of its committee work. But you know, there's a limit to what you can do with 129 MSPs. Westminster had 650 of us at the time. And whilst it's a bigger country, the number of MPs relates to the business. How many and are you suggesting we should have, Henry? Well, <laughs> re watch this space. Um, and that's why I feel that if we're looking seriously at giving more authority to our committee members, more investigative work, more time on the job, more ability to review legislation, then you have to think quite seriously about where the numbers of the parliament might be going in the years that lie ahead. Now, whether it's independence or whether it's federalism or status quo or home rule or whatever you call it, this parliament now has a lot of choices to make in relation to how I think they're elected, but also to be fair to them, a lot of fantastic work has been done, but you cannot keep pouring you know, a quart into a pint pot because essentially something has got to give. So I feel that we should be more ambitious in the way we look at these things. And the other point about it is they're only ideas. You know, Scotland needs ideas, ideas, ideas. But at the end of the day, um, I wouldn't like to think that we shouldn't applaud what's happening in Scotland. And if you want, as I said, to look inwards to Westminster over the, the 14 years I was there, you know, this is really powerful stuff. And people complain about the, the amount of legislation. But you know, that was the pent up frustration at Westminster. Things need to be done in Scotland. Some was administrative, but most of it was legislative. I don't see the figures actually diminishing at the present time. And if Scotland requires things to be done in the interests of Scots, hey, use your parliament, use legislation. We've got hands going up all over the place now, so I'm going to take uh, Irene Oldfather, and then there's a gentleman right up at the back row. So Irene first. Thanks very much. Over here. Thanks very much, Ken, and it's been really interesting to listen to this reflection on the committee structure. I had the privilege of chairing a committee, but I also set up and chaired a cross-party group. And I'd be interested in the panel's reflections on the role of cross-party groups within the Parliament, because it seems to me that they provide a huge opportunity. And to pick up the point made by the gentleman in the second row from the back, they're actually sitting round the table, communities and organisations and young carers are sitting round the table with parliamentarians with a huge opportunity to influence that agenda and thinking about the cross-party group that the three of us actually worked on um, the cross-party group on Alzheimer's and dementia have the opportunity to produce pieces of work and we did the charter of rights and I'm proud that the two colleagues sitting uh, beside me who are from different political parties from my own put their heart and soul into working with communities and people with dementia and their carers to produce that piece of work. So to me, the cross-party groups in Parliament provide a great opportunity. I don't know if there needs to be a little bit of amendment around how they're currently working, but that might be something that the panel would want to reflect on. Thanks, and I'll ask the, the, the members to think about who wants to respond to that point while I take the gentleman right at the very back up there. Um, I just wonder what the panel feels about how the standard of debate has changed over the last 20 years. Has it improved? Uh, is there still room for improvement? And has the famous horseshoe shape, which Henry referred to, actually encouraged uh, a sort of consensus. Certainly sitting in the press gallery, it never looked like that. Uh, and I suppose it never will. But I would be very interested to hear whether the actual sort of atmosphere of the parliament has improved the standard of debate. Very good, we'll have a think about that. I know that Kenny Ferguson was talking about the, the first speech by Donald Dewar, talking about the the, 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 the voices of the Mairns, the ring of the speak of the Mairns, that's right. Dinner of the Clyde shipyards. Dinner of the shipyards and the welders. The well, a new voice in the land, that's exactly it. Now, I'm going to skip generations, if you don't mind me saying so, to a young woman just over here. Yes. 
Um, so I'm 17 years old, so I'm not even as old as the devolved government here. And I know that social media has played a huge role in my involvement in politics and my choice to actually study politics. Specifically, the independence referendum in 2014 was kind of my first taste of Scottish politics at 13. Um, but I was wondering, actually, what your thoughts were on devolvement and the reflection on then and now and the youth involvement in politics, specifically Scottish youth, um, you know, with pressing issues discussed such as young mental health issues that I'm quite passionate about, or even the scrapping of music tuition, you know, just with discussion of 16-year-old votes um, and how, like, you think youth will have their competence at 16 to, you know, be involved in politics and have that level of knowledge to vote in politics at 16. Thanks very much. Awesome. Good point, yes. <laughs> Good point. Now, can I just ask the panel to respond to a, a couple of different points there. Uh, Cross-party groups, uh, the standard of oratory in the Parliament and our involvement and, and the support that we give young people and whether or not that has been, whether that has changed over the 20 years of this Parliament. Robin, I can see you looking at me. I'm not sure whether that's quizzically or with enthusiasm. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to concentrate my marks on this one down uh, as, as much as I can. Um, one of the things about the debates is the five minutes, six minutes limit. I think every MSP should be given a ration of time to use over the years so that just occasionally you can stand up in this chamber and give a reasoned, long speech of 15 to 20 minutes where you can show that you've been listening to other people and comment on what they've been saying. Um, and, uh, and, and that would be a debate. What, what happens at the moment is not a debate. If you've got five minutes, um, you take one intervention, and if you uh, politely and do mention another MSP's contribution, that's a third of your time gone. Um, and you're left with three minutes, which is 150 words. Well, 300 if you speak very fast. Um, but um, you, you can't, that, that they're not debates. They're, they're just, you know, I've ne I, I, I remember very, very few um, discussions in this parliament in, in, in here that could have qualified as being a real debate. Debates happen in committees. Mm. Uh, I wish that the press would comment on what happens in committee more than they do. Mm. I would just add two comments to that if I may just uh, uh, as somebody who's currently looking at that very issue uh, through parliamentary reform um, we do, some of the best debates are actually in the uh, what are called the members debates after the yeah. vote. Uh, so they're not whipped, anybody can contribute and they're nearly always slightly more thoughtful very less uh, party political and less tribal. Yes, I should have meant, That's right. and, yes. and, and another issue that also bears into it, one of the biggest features of this parliament is that we are family friendly. We have a decision time at five o'clock every day. It's one of the most important um, principles in which the parliament is founded. But a downside, if you can call it downside, is that everything then works back from five o'clock and you have time limited debates on everything. Because if you have to have the votes at five, then you've only got, let's say, three hours for a debate or two and a half hours for a certain debate, and then you have to be proportional. Therefore, you have to divide the time up within that, and that's how you end up with this. You get a six-minute speaking slot or a four-minute speaking slot, and in that four minutes, you've got to get a couple of points across, and therefore, you don't take intervention. So it becomes a slightly self-fulfilling prophecy, and so people end up standing up and reading their party positions at opponents rather than discussing issues. So I just say that because we are wrestling, and in fact, we've introduced a new reform, and it's already in place, that if we can agree on a debate... Uh, members can take more time and by agreement members can stand up and speak for 12 minutes uh, so long as they discuss it with me and others beforehand because uh, I'm in the chair um, and, and that but, but so far nobody's really pushed that we've had a couple of nine minute contributions but that's all we've had so far so but I, I'm still full of hope for that now cross-party groups Annabelle or George did you ever sit in a cross-party group were you a, a fan of the way they um, I love access to the Parliament. Yes, I was. I think on certainly one, if not a couple. I agree with Irene. I think they have a, a relevance. The great thing about a cross-party group is it diffuses, and this is Esther's concern, it diffuses the party political friction because you get people bonded together by an interest in something, whether it was you know, dementia, whether it is uh, uh, mental health issues affecting young people, for example. They are bonded by that interest and they will work constructively. They will have an open remit to invite people in, to speak to them, to hear of experiences, to learn about views, and then they can compile a report. And if I were a government, I would pay very close attention to what that cross-party group was telling me 
because it might very well be the genesis of some much needed legislation. So I think they do have a role uh, to play. Um, uh, Henry, you were nodding, uh, I think particularly at the involvement of the young people as well. Yeah, I mean, I agree with the cross-party groups. I mean, that's a great way to build consensus. But the other point, maybe if I could make an, without boring people, analogy with football, you know, if you're good enough, you're old enough. I mean, I, I was in chair of a local government committee when I was 23. I played the first professional game at 16. And what I say to young people is, put yourselves forward, come forward, because you'll be patronised, as I was and I have done, to say the future is about our young people. This is a fantastic opportunity for us to do that. And so uh, there are far smarter people around when I was, uh, you know, first in local government, far better football players than I was when I first played uh, professionally. So, hey, take it, take it with the bull with both horns and get on with it because we, we need young people. The second point I just wanted to make was the question of uh, Jamie raised. Jamie, are you listening? <laughs> right. Belatedly, I just want to say anything that Farage says about broken politics, I wouldn't agree with Farage on anything. But secondly, Jamie, in terms of Scotland might doing it better, we just have to remember we voted to remain. That would have solved a big problem um, in Scotland, as we did <laughs> in terms of the vote. And finally, um, the point about... <laughs> and finally, the point about the horseshoe shape, I think psychologically it's a lot better. I remember standing at the dispatch box during the devolution debate and one of the English uh, ministers threw a Scotsman at me. That was the only peril that I nearly fell under. So... Um, but it's psychologically, it's good. And the quality of debate, I think, is influenced by Robin's point. You cannot have a speech for three, six, or 12 minutes. And apart from maybe a bank of minutes you can use during the year, it would be a great opportunity to allow parliamentarians to have a longer speech sometime, not just a maiden speech, a longer speech. And if it's anything to cheer you up, Robin, when I did my maiden speech in the House of Commons, it was July, it was 1.30 a.m. in the morning, it was about the future of local government, and there was five people in the chamber. Hey, <laughs> we've done a lot better than that, so let's stick with it. Tricia. I think you covered very well, President Officer, the, um, the difficulties of extending speeches and also to hold to the principle that it's a family family parliament. Yeah. And that would need a huge change in the way that we operate. Um, you know, if we want to go on till 12 o'clock at night, 1 o'clock in the morning, then fine, you can have as long speeches as you want. But having sat through some of the Brexit debates, uh, quite frankly, speeches of 30, 35 minutes not only are boring, um, but I'm not sure that they contribute much to the greater wisdom uh, that there is. But, you know, if, if you want a final friendly parliament, you've got to make concessions about how you can achieve that. Um, second thing, cross-party groups, I agree. I think the cross-party groups work, they work well, um, and I think they've made a huge contribution to this place. I think it's one of the finest things we've done. I think there's too many. There's not enough MSPs. I think there needs to be a bit of consolidation of the cross-party groups. You can't have a cross-party group on every single health issue there is, and sometimes that's how it feels. In terms of young people, I think I want to mention two things. Firstly, um, I don't think we've even talked tonight about a public petitions committee, which was, you know, a world leader um, in what we did, or the electronic voting, we were so ahead of it. Mm -hmm. But one of the other things that we did that is rarely spoken about is that at the very inception of this parliament, we had an education centre. We had an education centre up the road, we've got an education centre built in here, we've, we've got trained teachers, we've got youngsters from all over Scotland who come in here, they engage in their parliament, they learn about their parliament, they meet with the parliamentarians, and I think that's been fantastic. And we've also had, almost from the beginning, the Scottish Youth Parliament, which runs in parallel to this parliament. And they have had some great campaigns, they have been really engaged, um, I think we are not perfect. I think Votes for 16 is a huge leap forward. Um, I agree with Henry that we need to have Votes at 16 in every single election that we have. Um, but I think we've come an awful long way um, and we are far further ahead than I think most parliaments throughout Europe Great. or the world. Thanks, Richard. And George. Yeah. Sorry. 
On the issue of, of speeches, I mean, I look back fondly having six minutes to speak after uh, experiencing the European Parliament where the maximum length of time was two minutes and it's through interpretation. So six minutes was, uh, sounded to me, a really luxurious amount of time. So, and I think if you actually think back to some of the big contentious debates around free personal care, myself, a good number of uh, Irene, Margaret, etc., uh, 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 Mary Scanlon all took part in that. It was a hugely powerful debate, despite the fact we were only limited to four or five months. The fishing debate was another one. Uh, massively powerful debate. So I'm not convinced it's only just about the time. It's actually about the subject. It's about how uh, motivated the politicians are to express themselves. And you find that in very, very uh, big debates of content where there's real contention, you actually find that politicians are, uh, within 45 minutes can actually articulate and make very powerful speeches in favour or against the, the issue that's before us. So I, I don't think we want to get too hung up on time. Uh, maybe the problem is too many bland debates where there's actually nothing at stake. Mm. So you maybe should maybe think a little bit more about that. Indeed. And a final point from Robin. Uh, yes, uh, parliamentary engagement with uh, schools and young people. The cross-party group um, on children and young people is one of the best attended cross-party groups in the entire parliament. At least it certainly was when I was here, and I, I, hope, it's, I hope it still is. Uh, anybody confirm that? I hope so. Um, we also hosted the finals of one of the big debating, schools debating um, uh, competitions. But essentially, this is where schools come in, that schools, our educational system, should be giving young people the confidence, activities in school that give them the confidence to get up and speak for themselves. The comment I made earlier about school councils, if you don't give them uh, a budget, then it's, it, it's toy politics. All they learn is when they go to the head teacher with the discussions they've had and he says no or she says no, all, all they've learnt is that politics does, democracy doesn't work. Um, yeah, that, 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 uh, our, our schools really, that there's something, that when they disaggregated the, the regions, um, a whole lot of extra things, or people think taught as extras, like outdoor education, went out the window. Every school in Lothian region had a school bus that took people out. Had, they had skiing, they had teachers who got time off to ta take kids away. This has all disappeared. And yet everybody knew how fundamentally good outdoor education can be for uh, the development, um, the personal development of young people in terms of confidence and getting on with other people, empathy and all these uh, uh, th things that will make the politicians of the future and good politicians. And I think some of these good politicians are clearly in this room, but I'm afraid, despite I can see Kathy Peter and other members' hands going up now, I'm afraid it's not the end of the evening because we're going to adjourn downstairs, at which point, um, please grab one of the many politicians, either on our panel or in the room, and over a glass of wine, continue this conversation. Uh, but I'd like, if I can, you to join me in thanking our panel. I'd like you to thank the many MSPs who've come along uh, to join us, members of the Constitutional Convention, including Joyce McMillan there as well as Esther, uh, Ken McFarkerson and all colleagues from the Times for their co-sponsorship, but most of all, yourselves for making this such an enjoyable night. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.